Welcome back to the Transforming Basketball Podcast. Absolutely delighted today to be joined by someone who's had probably the biggest influence on the way I view the game through an ecological perspective now. Um, he's uh, really uh, doing just tremendous work in this field. Two fantastic books who I'm sure a lot of you in this podcast will be familiar with, How We Learn to Move and Learning to Optimize Movement. So it's a pleasure to welcome Rob Gray. Rob, thanks so much. My pleasure, Alex. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So first question I, I wanted to start with, and this is something you've spoken about on your excellent Perception Action podcast too. A lot of people nowadays are seeing everything kind of related to an ecological approach, to constraint set approach, and they're saying it's merely old wine being rebranded in new bottles. And I know we it's absolutely not that, but could you maybe speak a little bit as to why that's certainly not the case? Yeah, I think it's, uh, on the one hand, I, I can see why people think that, because on the surface, some of the methodologies are not new. Like, I think that's one of the reasons I find people are so excited about this and, and adopt it is because good coaches have been using things like small-sided games and constraints for a long time. Um, why it's not new is the they're using it for different reasons and different kind of, uh, on, using a different approach to learning, um, not as... Uh, so yes, the people have been doing some of these things for quite a while, but I don't think with the same uh, goal of self-organization yeah. and giving problems to the athlete. I, I think that is pretty new, even from the games-based approach, like the, you know, yeah. teaching games for understanding and games yeah. has been around for a long time, but that's more a focus on kind of cognitive understanding principles that equal, not on the same kind of thing we're talking about here. That's great. And that actually leads on to another point, which is just differences between a games-based approach and the CLA. Would What would you say are some really kind of coherent differences? Because I think a lot of coaches maybe misinterpret the CLA just for being a games-based approach. Yeah, I think I think that this is kind of a subtle sticking one that some people have trouble with. Yeah. Um, I think people, you know, I think the key idea in the ecological approach is the idea of giving people movement problems to solve and having them representative of the environment. So sometimes we're actually going to move way away from the game and make something that doesn't really look game like at all. Um, in the ecological approach, that's okay. And actually we want to do that sometimes. I don't think in the game space approach, you would yeah. really do that right? because all in and the other, the game space approach, the theory behind it from my understanding is very uh, about uh, understanding principles. And whereas, um, Ecological approach is much more about picking up information, affordances, opportunities, rather than thinking so much and understanding these higher level principles and, yeah. and uh, being such a cognitive player, like always thinking about what you do to do that. To me, those are the main things that I see as different. Love that. Um, something you've spoken about um, is coaches setting up an activity and then you 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 use use the term the real magic is what happens next, and I think this is really important for coaches to understand and kind of link to the, the point you just made about differences between the games approach. It's so important to obviously see what's going on. Would you have any advice for coaches as to maybe what they should be looking at in these activities and how that might inform what direction they move to next? Yeah, I think this is a real, what I've been seeing, this is the kind of the next step in kind of scaling this up, right? Anybody can, oh, okay, I see some constraint, like watch your videos. And, oh, there's a constraint I can put on. But what do you do after? And so I think a couple of things. One is, the, you know, the best is watching some other coach. <laughs> watching as many opportunities you can, watch, even sometimes different sports, how they kind of make adjustments. But I think having a clear idea of what you want to see, like, you want to, what kind of exploration do you want to see? What, what kind of, in setting up this constraint, what are you hoping it encourages? And mm. are you seeing that? Um, if not, how can we kind of push, tr try to guide people in, in the way? Sometimes, you know, the really good coaches I, I work, sometimes it's, it's stepping in and saying something, even though that's kind of sacrilegious almost seems like, but yeah, sometimes yeah. it's, why don't you try this? Um, sometimes yeah. it's adding another constraint or different. So I think that's part of it, really being clear on what you're hoping it will encourage. Yeah, that's it. And I guess it's it's difficult because especially something I'm seeing is just how a lot of coaches have this very fixed practice plan where mm -hmm. kind of everything is pre-planned and pre-thought out. 
And then I think it makes it very difficult for you to be adaptable as a coach and change because we don't always know what will happen when we're scaling, manipulating constraints. So would you say that the practice plan needs to be a lot more flexible, you know, for, for coaches, basketball coaches who really want to go down this, this, this kind of route, they've got to be way more open and leave some things not completely predetermined and actually planned out. Yeah, I think so. I think that's really the key. And I really, you know, I like some of the things like some people like Craig Morris, who yeah. Rowan Co has written about like yeah. being open to and reaching out to um, what happens in front of you instead of, you know, we're so yeah, almost everything we train, we want to do so many reps. So many, we have a, like a little recipe we've written out beforehand. I think we want to kind of be a bit more flexible and, and yeah. responsive to and adaptive to what we see in front of us. I think we're missing yeah. a lot of opportunities if we don't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I wanted to shift this a little bit to to skill and what skill is. And I think you've you've done such a good job, obviously, defining that in, I think it was in how, how we learn to move. You made it really clear, obviously, talking about skill being the relationship between the environment and the individual. Something which I think is where some confusion is arising is the difference between skill and action capacities. Would you be able to talk a little bit about that, Rowan? I know you've got a great podcast episode, which I'll also direct coaches to in the show notes because you covered this in a previous episode. Yeah, so, yeah, skill. So um, skill obviously is a functional goal uh, relationship with the environment to achieve some goal, get the ball in the basket. Um, the uh, action capacity is is kind of a, it goes under Gibson's uh, concept of effectivity, kind of that your, your ability... Um, and I think there's a lot of things that fall under both physical and, and psych also their psychological, you know, you, how high can you jump? How fast can yeah. you run? Um, to me, the key thing that makes for me is action capacities give you the potential to be more skillful, right? They're giving you a wider range of movement solutions you could use, right? If I can jump higher, I have more options for how to score in basketball, right? I, I myself cannot dunk. That's not a affordance. <laughs> And it's it's so much, and the, the key thing in the ecological approach is, it's not a, not just that it's not an option. It's just the person will not even perceive it yeah. if it's not within their ability. I think we see that sometimes you see a player missing opportunity opportunities, and you think there's something wrong. It's they don't have the ability to execute or achieve that yeah. affordance, right? That opportunity. So I think that. So I think we have to be really, you know, I I, I like separating them because there's sometimes in training we want to focus on giving you more potential solutions. That doesn't make you more skillful necessarily. You have to put them yeah. into the action, but I think it. I think we do want to focus on that sometimes. Definitely. And I think just on this note, Rob, I think a lot of coaches get confused maybe when we might decouple, such as using an aqua bag mm -hmm. or, or something similar. And you've written about that with you know, some of the stuff Bosch is doing now. Mm -hmm. And you know, the reason we're doing that is obviously to develop these these capacities. But then we're we're still we're using small sided games where they might be able to attune to these affordances in a different way based on improved action capabilities so could you maybe talk about that process in terms of what the rationale would be actually to using something like an aqua bag and why we might do that yeah i think i think you uh in many ways you want to train action capacities a similar way to the way you train the skill right sure uh you want to yeah. be very more variable challenge the yeah. stability kind of rather than you know doing and you want it then just doing squats or something that's very yeah. controlled and um i think you want to be able to put in the skill it needs to have some of the same elements um and i think you know move developing for to be able to move force and transfer force is kind of what the action capacities we want so yeah i think those are the kind of the the main differences for me you know and oh. Um, I think we want you want adaptability. Some of the so some of the same things we're looking for in skill we want in our action capacities. Yeah, yeah, love that. So when it comes to skill, I think another misconception in basketball is that it's all about acting quickly and acting mm -hmm. fast. And mm -hmm. yes, there might be moments when that is relevant, such as maybe when there's an advantage and moving the ball quickly, driving, shooting allows you to you know, act on an affordance before the defense can actually recover back, back to mm -hmm. neutral. But a lot of the times it's, it's not about that. It's, it's about in your words, you know, waiting longer, exploring the affordance landscape and something better might emerge. 
Could you just build on that a little bit, if that's possible, Rob? Yeah. So this falls under the umbrella of a you know, big, big term, skilled intentionality, right? Yeah. The ability to keep. So the, the key concept here is the affordance, the opportunity for action, shooting, passing, whatever, whatever driving to the hoop are all affordances. I think, you know, we, as a skill, you really skilled players keep as many of those open for as long as possible right? until one kind of jumps out as being, you know, stronger or, or more, more inviting. I think sometimes that happens really early. You're right in a fast break or something. You might see a clear path to the hoop and you no, don't need to do any of this, keeping everything open because this one is so inviting. You just take it. But I think the ability, like in a two on one or like, to keep your options open, I think is a real, um, you know, I see this in the players I work in baseball, the ability to keep the option of stopping and going back to the bag and going forward, oh, both open and hold them kind of, they're, they're conflicting mm. goals, but you can, really good players can keep them both alive for longer. Um, so I think that's, you know, waiting to for something to come really inviting and, and then, this, this decision kind of emerges from that, I think is, is what yeah. is a large part of being really skillful is. Yeah, I love that. Um, and it's just uh, just a practical example. You can imagine just the player coming off a pick and roll. And, you know, like you just said, it it would not be advantageous to always pass early. Maybe sometimes mm -hmm. the affordance through that might appear, but other times it's just being patient. So it's a great example. Mm -hmm. Um so Rob, you're obviously doing, you know, so much in the coach development space. Um and you've actually done some recent work with NBA teams with, with the Spurs mm -hmm. and the Thunder. How do you go about, and it's great to see that these ideas are starting to be explored in the Basel world, mm -hmm. but how would you go about meeting coaches where they're at? Because, you know, it's a lot of these ideas, it's, they are very new to coaches and it, it can be quite intimidating sometimes for coaches to be exposed to the theory. So would you have any, you know, practical advice for the coaches out there who are maybe trying to get their colleagues on this approach or, or whatever, you know, how would you even start? Yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge sometimes. So I always kind of start with, you know, okay, what what drill or whatever you're running and how can we make, can we, I always like to start with variability and, and can we add a little more variability into that? Can we make it game? One of the things that I really noticed in, in my NBA, I'm sure you've seen this many times, you watch practice and, and playing and even in, when they play pick like players shoot probably 80 percent three point yeah. their success rate and then the game is 30 right what's going yep. what is that big difference right there's something in practice we're missing that um so can we add a little so you don't shoot from the exact same spot 10 times yeah. in a row can we make it a little more game like um can we okay so you want to work on pick and rolls okay can we start play where we start in the position of a pick and roll but give them option after that make it go yep. live to run a play so can we tweak a little bit of what you're doing and and go from start from where you are and kind of add a little yep. bit to that's what i try to do i think uh, rather than saying okay we need to jump right to a sm this small side of game and uh, yeah you know where people might be really kind of hesitant to make that big of a jump um can we you know what can we add to make it, you know, more representative yeah. I think, for me? Love that. And it's so easy, like just here in Portland, like you just said, we've done that. Just players shooting from a different place every time. And mm -hmm. we just, I give them the affordance to pass back. So I often have a plus one. So it's mm -hmm. like someone playing defense. And then if they don't think they can shoot, they could dribble to create a, an option mm -hmm. to shoot or pass and just get open. And it's, it's so simple. Like the smallest things can make yeah. such a huge difference. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Adding just a little bit, you know, and, and there's sometimes, you know, like player, sometimes it's the players too. Players like doing shooting practice in basketball, the same yeah. shots over and over. Um, can we just add a little bit, write something to make it a little more like the game? So yeah. um, I think that's what I, where I try to start with. People. That's, that's it. And, and on that note, I mean, one of the most kind of frequent responses I get from coaches kind of seeing these ideas are, Oh, but really successful coaches don't do this. But, you know, I think I think some of the most successful coaches of all time, I think they'd be intrigued by this. And I mean, you presented to Popovich, and I think you mm -hmm. you mentioned something you mentioned like what was his feedback to seeing this? Um, he was he was generally positive. He yeah, he, yeah. I had him, he came up and stood 
Uh, it came out at the end of my presentation and gave me an example and had me talk through it right in front of everyone, which awesome. is kind of intimidating <laughs> a little bit. Um, like training a defense, I think it was talking about defenders, lateral okay. movement and, and things like that. So, but yeah, I think so. I think a lot of the good coaches I've met have some of this in, you know, um, and have a natural like kind of a tendency to kind of let like, um, you know, let people kind of and I particularly let them individual constraints, you know, kind of let's see what this person can do rather than forcing something on them. I've seen a lot of that and, and the game, you know, games based using small sided games and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think the, a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of baseball coaches I've worked with some of the really, they just have a natural, um, yeah. they've, they figured this stuff out themselves kind of experiential knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And it's, it's interesting too, though, right? My, I'd be interested to hear, to hear your thoughts on this, Rob, but my gut feeling is I think it's actually easier for the players to respond to this quicker, maybe than coaches at first. Just seeing, I think just my experience here, like it took maybe four days for the players to get used to small-sided games because mm -hmm. it was just, they had kind of, they were just so not used to it. But then boom, straight away, they loved it. And I think, and I'm sure it's the same in baseball. Like a lot of times I think people say, oh, but pro players don't want to do that. But they've never actually been exposed to it. And just from what I've seen, I think they love it the moment they do something different. Yeah, for sure. I think people like, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, I, I find a bit of both, you know, some, yeah. some, especially when you get a little, maybe a little lower level, like minor league players are, they're a little, so different than what they're used to. Sure. I have to almost, I have a, yeah. I give a presentation on how, the, how, what learning really actually looks like. So you were, you're not going to be talked to by your coach. They're not going to come over and correct your body position all the time. And yeah. we're not with how it's going to be different. We're going to challenge you. You're going to fail sometimes. A lot of these people, players are not used to failing at the rate we want them to and things like that. So that's a little bit challenging. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I think they like the, you know, kind of freedom, the the autonomy of it, right? The, I, you know, I'm in control of what I'm, how I'm developing. I think people really like, they naturally go to that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. getting fee you no know, big getting feedback um you know i think so yeah i think i think so i think players in general like the approach as well Def definitely and kind of i guess staying on this nba topic for a little bit rob there's there's a huge use of performance analysis here a lot of video mm -hmm. um what do you think an ecological approach to performance analysis could look like maybe to improve how we're actually using video within the basketball world so kind of you're talking about kind of game not individual yeah. more in yeah life. maybe maybe in a team or it could even be like a lot of coaches like show clips individually to players now at the nba level but also kind of team setting you know reviewing kind of like often it's like 20 minutes of video before practice mm -hmm. of the previous game stuff like that yeah i think it's just i like the idea of kind of using it to kind of guide attention like okay mm -hmm. look there's this opportunity we could and especially i, I really like connecting it with practice as quickly as possible. That's Let's it. watch this video. Okay, show me how you would do this differently. Not yep. just talk about it in the seat in a lecture yeah. or something. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that, that I think there's a lot of opportunity, and you know, to kind of point out opportunity, you know, direct people's guide attention to where the you know affordances you know might be and, and things like that, um, yeah. rather than using it in a very corrective. Okay, you should have done that. Yeah. You should be here. Uh, kind of way so i think i think changing and i i like it and really I, as much as possible you know get knowledge of versus not let's see you demonstrate how you would do show me how you would do this differently rather yeah. than just talking about it yeah completely like that's something here just trying to actually get the same maybe keeping the video really specific so instead of this mm -hmm. kind of small sport of all these different things like you said effectively educate intention just like three things and then design activities where they're actually doing mm. it and it's it's not difficult to, yeah, to do that for sure yeah yeah, yeah I, I think there's a lot of you know one of the things i've been challenges i've been finding in with stuff i've working is because you're you know basketball you play fairly often you have you have to kind of blend development and preparation game yeah. you know skill development and game preparation kind of blending to each other a lot so i think there's a ways you can do that for example, let's watch the opponent we're going to play. Okay, well, let's now put this into practice and in some activities right now. Um, I think there's some some ways you can do that that, that would be yeah. really effective. Love it. Um, 
So Rob, I'm having some more col- uh, discussions with colleagues here who are really keen on exploring this, but kind of linked back to what we talked about earlier with where you start. And I think the variability just starting with the practical application is huge so they can see it. But then if we, when we do come to the theory, I think it's quite intimidating because we've got ecological dynamics, then obviously we've got nonlinear pedagogy and the CLA. Do you feel like it's the nonlinear, and I know you did another great podcast on this, I feel like I keep saying it, <laughs> but do you feel like nonlinear pedagogy is relevant i think there are bits of it which absolutely like the design principles which are key but do you think sometimes it's just a little bit too much to be using all these terms straight away could we maybe just focus on maybe one part of the cla or key kind of few parts of an ecological framework what what would you advise yeah i know they're probably gonna get mad at me for saying this but i think (laughs) non the i i've never really liked the non-linear pedagogy i think it adds unnecessarily complication um, yeah. Nonlinear pedagogy is really just a CLA, right? It's really just a teaching method underlying ecological, the practical te- teaching method that comes out of ecological dynamics. Yeah, uh, I get nonlinear. You know, I guess that's important to emphasize that. Yeah, you know, it's an important point to make. Uh, but that's not something completely separate, and I think people get confused sometimes. So, um, I think you know some. Of the, I say that, but some of the the that area people that work in that area, like Rich. Rick, Yili Chow and yeah. uh, Rich Shuttleworth. Some of the best writing is in that area, like I think. So some of the best papers are easier to understand. So I wouldn't dismiss it completely. <laughs> There's yeah, definitely some for sure. there. A lot of it is very, you know, aligns with the other as well, for sure. Yeah, love that. So Rob, this is kind of like a, a whistle stop tour on contemporary skill acquisition for basketball coaches. So okay. we're covering a, a lot here. One, I wanted to, to cover kind of one last thing before I wrap up with the last question. And that is differential learning. And I think okay. it's it's been a little bit confusing over the last few months. Like Wolfgang Schohorn, who invented it, has reached out to me and it, it mm-hmm. got me a little bit confused. Mm-hmm. But I'd love just to hear your ideas aside from anything that's going on on how you, what you think, well, A, what DL is for coaches to, to listen to that and maybe how that could supplement some of the things we've spoken about in the podcast today. Yeah, so I, I agree. I, I've had similar struggles with that since this movie. <laughs> I think there's two kind of, there's what you get from the actual articles, which what I've tried to interpret and try to, and versus kind of what you hear from people, uh, especially yeah. that do it directly are a little bit different, I think. But for me, it's just, so I always think it, you know, it's at, it's getting you to explore the movement space and deliberately push you into areas that maybe you will never go back to, but you'll, you'll learn, you know, getting to you to shoot off one foot with one eye closed, you know, uh, getting you to shoot with in your hands this way. Um, so I, I think it's, it, to me, that's the fun you kind of learning about the movement space and the idea you'll be able to find a solution more easily that will work. Um, it's very, it's kind of, it's a bit different than the CLA for me, which is more focused on kind of directing you to a part of movement space more deliberately. Yeah. I still think it can be useful. I, I, I like it combining it with, um, yes. and I, I, with the CLA and, and adding it if it's, if it's, um, I find it, you know, the extreme version is a bit, I, I think I've said this a few times, a bit of harder sell to elite athletes. Like I want you to hit with your one eye closed. Why? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. They want to hit more of, I want you to hit with this heavier back. Cause it's going to make you, you know, yeah. that, that's a bit easier of a sell. Um, but I, there's definitely a lot of research and, and then, you know, some of that you really, the theory behind it is it gets very heavy, like stochastic residents and all yeah. this kind of stuff. But uh, I, I just kind of, I think it's very valuable to kind of put, push people into, to movement solutions and, and things that they may yeah. not have tried before. Absolutely. Um, I think it, it can be useful. Um so yeah, I I definitely think it's a useful thing, yeah. even though yeah, as I understand it, right? Yeah, I've yeah, had similar discussions <laughs> that you've had and critiques. Um, but uh, I I think it, it's an interesting way to do. It. Yeah, definitely. And it's I think it's I've been using a lot here in shooting, and I think it's trying to get over with coaches the idea that by doing this, we can get them using a different kind of movement solution or exploring a different part of the solution space, like you said, and we don't know what that could be eventually Mm. right and it's it's being okay with that unknown and i mean i think the other thing rob is knowing maybe what the l exercises to do so it's more 
I guess, strategic variability as opposed to completely random. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I had a player yesterday struggling with like shot arc. So he had a lot of front rim misses. Mm -hmm. So I was doing things to perturb the system, just things like shooting different, different stances, but then he couldn't bend his legs at all. And then the next rep, he could bend it, he over exaggerate the bend Mm -hmm. and just doing little things like that. And then, like you said, you can combine it with a CLA task, then you can mix in some one-on-one shooting off that easily. Would that be a good example of what, what yeah, you're speaking about? I like yeah. that. I like kind of uh, focusing the variability a little around a problem you identify, I think. Um, I, th- I think that's a better way to use it than, yeah. I, I don't think anyone does completely, like, that's why I think the articles are a bit mislike doing a pirouette before you start. Yeah. It's, no one's yeah. going to do that. That's a no, bit too exactly. Um, But, or playing, you know, soccer with your arms crossed then your hand on your head. Like, I think focusing it around more of a, uh, a strategic thing. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I be, the things that's hard for me, I've really recently tried to have to emphasize hard for coaches to get over is the idea that if I give you a movement problem, the, the, the you, ha- you having to solve that is yeah. incredibly value, even if it's a problem you'll never face ever in a game ever. Yeah. But as long yeah. as it has the same, it's representative as the same structure. Um, that's a kind of a hard sell sometimes to people. Yeah. Differential learning has a bit of that, I think, in it. Um, but yeah, I, I do like that, like kind of focusing around a specific, like smaller variations around a, a certain solution. Love that. So I guess, Rob, my last question for today is, what would you like to see in terms of the future maybe of skill acquisition research and continuing to try and bridge the gap between practical application and theory. Is there anything you'd like to see maybe change within this space just to help more coaches continuing to understand what this is actually all about? Yeah, I think we've made a lot of headway. I think, you know, I think I love, you know, all the examples people are putting, you know, yourself and and people in other sports, you know, some of the really exciting ones like in martial arts now, jujitsu, people posting great examples of how they're using it. Um, I really, I think that's really useful. The only thing hesitance I have with that is it's not don't it's more than just copying what they're doing, That's right? It. It's more yep. about the actual using the principles rather than just copying a bunch of exercises you see. Um, I think that, you know, I think on from as a researcher and as, I think and I guess as a coaching, you know, one of the dirty secrets we've been hiding for a long time is everybody knows you have to individualize a coach be effective coach, right? You have to adapt to the individual in front of you. you. Can't, And we have the challenge of you have a camp with 20 kids in front of you. How do you do that? And both on a research level and a practical level, we have to figure out ways we can, I think more and more ways we can um, look at individual skill acquisition and adapt it to the individual. Cause that's what good coaches do and already, but I think we've been kind of not, not recognizing that for a while. So that, that's kind of thing. And, and then I, you know, I just, I think just keep, you know, um, as people keep exploring this, you know, I think I ended my last book. I like people, I love people that were willing to share as all along the way, right? Even if you don't have a full understanding of the theory and you still share what you're learning and how, you know, some things might change. You know, some of my yeah. early podcasts, I'm sure I wouldn't want some, I say something very different than I do now. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really useful for people seeing your journey. Yeah. Yeah, definitely well Rob thank you so much obviously highly recommend your books and the podcast which we'll link to in the show notes but big thanks for taking the time today I really enjoyed the discussion my pleasure Alex thank you